Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are so excited that you could join us today for On Awakening Your Inner Shaman. I'm Alex Elliott, the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, we CIS public programs must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional unceded Ramaytush Ohlone lands. If you are interested in learning more about native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now let me first introduce our presenters, Marcela Lobos and Susana Bustos, and then we will get right to their conversation. Marcela Lobos has been extensively initiated in the healing and spiritual traditions of the Amazon and the Andes. She was born and raised in Chile, where she leads shamanic journeys for women to awaken their own power, grace, and wisdom. Marcella travels internationally, teaching the wisdom of the Moon Nike and the Andean Medicine Wheel. Susana Bustos works as adjunct faculty and student's mentor at California Institute of Integral Studies. She also conducts independent research on entheogenic shamanic traditions of the Americas and holds a private practice in Berkeley, California. Her main focuses of teaching, clinical practice, and research revolve around the healing potential of non-ordinary states of consciousness and their integration in ordinary life, as well as around adequately bridging Amerindian cosmologies and practices into the West. Susana carries an Ashanikan lineage from the upper Peruvian Amazon area, which informs her work. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Marcela and Susana. Marcela, such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for, for being in Chile as well, mm -hmm. my home country, and coming from, from that place of, of land. Thank I'm you, gonna... Susana. What an honor to be with you and that we share some of the same passion for the shamans of Peru and the Amazon. So I am really thrilled to be with you and everyone listening. Thank you. Marcela, you have such an extensive trajectory and I thought that the, the place to, to start is to, for you to tell us a little bit about your trajectory as a medicine woman. Hmm. Wow. So um, like, like the trajectory of ma many um, medicine people, um, it starts with realizing that we are so wounded in a way. Uh, it, it starts by realizing our own wounding and the need to want to come to a place of peace and, and um, just calm inside of ourselves. So that's how it was, at least for me. And I know that the way... Um, of the wounded healer is such an archetypal and so a universal guide for, for so many that we find that we have a wound and we want to bring some healing to it and we go out in this quest and we learn so, so much and we're able to help others but then we, our wound keeps festering and, and oozing so we just keep on the search and more and more we, we find that peace and, and that uh, refuge in our own lives. But um, nevertheless, we, we, we learn to also help others. And, and uh, that's how my journey started when I could not see my wounding. I left my country that it was coming out of a dictatorship. I grew up in dictatorship uh, from the 70s until 1990, and then all, all that healing that our country, Chile, needed to have. So I left a little bit feeling rebellious to that whole atmosphere. And then I, I ran into my, my wounding when I was in my, um, I was traveling. I was in the US, I became a mother, 
and I found myself in a very disempowering place. So everything I ran uh, from, I found 10,000 miles from home. So I know how it follows us. And, and then when I was at, uh, at the end of my rope kind of thing, I was really in what we know as the dark night of the soul. I, I really, I finally cracked open to, to, to sense and feel that there was a reality bigger than me and bigger than all of us. And I became mm -hmm. curious about that and I found the shamanic path. That's beautiful. So that's the start of it, yes. Thank you. I, you know, in what you're talking about, and also in your book, your new book, you talk about the shamanic, uh, like answer, answering a call as part of the shamanic awakening to become a healer in one's community, or you say also cultivating a purpose bigger than oneself to benefit others. Um, mm -hmm. Can you expand a little bit on that idea and how can we recognize that call in uh, one's life? Mm -hmm. So that call comes like a whisper, something that says, um, uh, we start wondering, we ask the big questions of life, why I'm here, who am I really, and what is my purpose, and, and many times it's like that whisper, and because we are so busy working or so busy taking care of uh, uh, our chores, our duties, and we've been um, told that that's the right thing to do in our lives. So we <clears throat> we find ourselves many times in a routine, but then suddenly that routine starts feel feeling very superficial or really not bringing us any any deeper um, fulfillment. So we we become curious, hopefully, and start looking. And, and when we don't um, dare to look and, and to go on a quest to ask those questions, the word quest comes from question, I mean, same root. So when we don't ask those questions and we don't go on that quest, then we, we have all seen how the calling can come through a crisis, through something very difficult that wakes us up. So the calling in the, in the shamanic world, we speak about the calling from spirit, but it's really the calling. And in, in, in the language of uh, mythology of Joseph Campbell is the call to adventure. So the call to, to realize uh, why we are here and what is, uh, what is a deeper purpose for us in life. And, and hopefully we embark on that journey. And I speak in my book about that journey. That it, in, your, in your book, it's very interesting the way that you also put together these two maps, the map of the medicine wheel of the Andes and also the, the map of Joseph Campbell's um, a hero's journey in that way. And uh, you know, both of them come from different uh, perspectives, paradigms, right? One comes from just is held in an indigenous mind understanding of the cyclic uh, nature of life and the orientation. I want to ask you a little bit more about that, and then and then uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's comes from from a much more deep psychology uh, path in that way where you know the individual is at the center um and i wonder how do you reconcile both paradigms um mm -hmm. in the book yes mm -hmm. yes so when i said that i found the shamanic path it was really um this compass of the medicine wheel that gave me uh brought me back to my deeper self deeper essence um if you want, I can go through it quickly now. Um, we'll get there. But then I realized when I found the, the hero's journey and read um, Joseph Campbell's book about the monomyth, I realized that I had been in all those stages. And I said, wow, this is not only about um, 
mythological figures and heroes of the past. And it's not only for Hollywood and not only for, um, for a, a, a thread, a line for books, but it's really something that we can all experience. And so it was great to actually have gone through the experience and then find the map. I had, I had known another map, like I said, the Medicine Wheel, but not this one. So the Medicine Wheel was my first map and, and the hero's journey came later. I see. So th that brings me also to the other, to the other question, you know, which is like the Western mind in that way and the, the beautiful way in, in which you, you know, you're trained and uh, as a journalist, right, at the university, you have, you're defined as a Chilean mestiza, you're also a student of Buddhism, a practitioner of yoga, you also are part of, you know, this uh, beautiful society, the, the Four Winds Society with your husband, Alberto Villoldo. And it is as if you're like putting together different threads and weaving them in that way, in, um, in, in a uh, map that's larger. So I, I, I wonder when, when we are there, and I think of us Westerners, even mestizos, we have so many different influences in that way. What is it that you can tell us about this weaving together of different threads and paradigms? Mm -hmm. um, well, I feel like, um, or what I've seen um, is that the medicine people of very traditional settings, like I worked a lot with the medicine women, uh, the medicine people of Southern Chile are mostly women, maybe 90 some percent, interesting. So um, I saw, and also working with the, the, the shamans in Peru and then in other places, I, I saw how attached to the land they are, it's like, it's not like they own land. It's almost like the land owns them. And they, they, are, um, they are so rooted in, in the landscape. They're so informed by the place around them, like their mountains, their rivers. It's like that's the, 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 the landscape is, is their breath too. They breathe with the landscape. So I, I found it very difficult um, like um, I traveled with some of them. I even took them to the US and it, it, it was really like a tremendous adventure for them. And not only like for someone that has never gotten on a plane, but my medicine woman mentor in Southern Chile, for her, it was like she lost her bearings and she would get dizzy and sick. So I try not to um, take her out of her home ever again. But uh, um, for us Westerners, I feel like we have migrated so much throughout the last hundred years, hundreds and thousands of years. And if we have moved around, it's, it's in our genes somehow. Um, personally, I have a good percentage of Native American, but I'm also very European and even some Africans. So I think it's inside of us to, to wanna explore our roots somehow. And it um, is not surprising to me, perhaps that we are so curious because the medicine people I have worked with in South America, their, their cosmology is their world and they is so rich for them and is, it's, it holds them so strongly. It's such a powerful foundation and, and they have all their answers there. So when, when we have been throughout the centuries, cut, like had the experience as Westerners of our roots being cut. Like if you, if you know about herbs and you remember how to uh, dialogue with the earth and and speak to the mountains and, and, and stones, you, you could be even be killed and, and hang or burn at the stake. So somehow we, and, and also our spirituality 
that is institutionalized uh, taught us how to look to the skies only and only to certain places in the sky. So in a way, I feel like at least for me and many other people I have known in the path is this like really uh, powerful feeling, longing to recover our roots. But like I said, our roots are not only in one place. So m we may feel the need to go and journey and travel. And, and personally also, I feel like I, I do have my roots um, genetically in my blood, but also whenever I have had the opportunity to really open my third eye, my spiritual eyes, and, and see my past lives. So many of my past lives were in India. So I have a very strong pull to, to the traditions of the Himalayas as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's not a mystery, I guess, that we are curious and, and want to remember. So the shamanic path then for a Westerner might be very different than, uh, than for people who are indigenous to their land in the way that I'm hearing what you're saying. And um, would, you, would you speak about these differences a little bit more? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to recognize that we are all indigenous, aboriginals of the earth. I mean, there's not one person that I know that has been born in a rocket. Maybe someone was born on a, on a plane. But so I think that as Westerners also, we got to remember that we belong and that we can sit on the embrace of, of Mother Earth and, and that we belong in the garden and we have not been cast out. That's just such a myth that we have to heal. And we must remember that we are nourished every single day for breakfast, lunch, and in between, and that we have refuge and shelter. So we have never been really cast out, but we have forgotten that we live in abundance and, and also that we must share the abundance with each other. And, and uh, so I think that's at the root of how we experience um, spirituality. When, when we feel that we have a home, that, that we are at home, um, then we can relax, our nervous system can relax, and then we can open up to, to see beyond, because the shaman mm -hmm. sees beyond. The shaman um, it's, um, sees through what it seems to be, uh, sees beyond the, the, the physical, literal reality, even beyond emotions, even just see is, is able to even see energy. And different shamans, of course, have different levels of accomplishment and of wisdom. But so um, a Westerner has to recover in my, in my, um, uh, from my experience, uh, her roots. And for us, it might be, for some of us, it might be one place, like go back home, go back to, like I, I, I remember this lady, um, Afri African-American, she finally found refuge and home when she went back to Africa mm -hmm. and did that pilgrimage. So it doesn't mean that we have to go live somewhere else, but at least go in pilgrimage to where we feel we might find some rooting, some grounding, some reconnecting to, to the earth. To our, pater, to our mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I understand that there is direct connection with the roots and we might have different uh, imp imprints, different roots in different parts of the world in that way. And some of them call qu uh, louder than others, uh, right? So in that it's within that exploration that there is something there that uh, impulses us through the wheel, uh, the medicine wheel that you're talking about, or that roots the medicine wheel in some way or another. And I would really love it if you could like explain more and share with us uh, how this medicine wheel works to situate oneself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, so the medicine wheels are ancient um, compasses, platforms um, to, to know where we're standing and where is our north or where is the sun rising, when is the equinox, um, what happens in the equinox in the solstices and so forth. And so they, they help us uh, track time, but also spatially, like so in the wheel has these spokes from the center to divide time and space in uh, like a compass that can help us remember where we are at. And in this shamanic and spiritual medicine wheel for, 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 for uh, helping us not just stand physically, but emotionally, psychically, spiritual, um, in the South, we find, in South America, we find these four great archetypes, which are the serpent being the guardian keeper of, the, of one of the quadrants of the South direction. Then we have the jaguar guarding, keeping, and, and, and being a, a guide in, in the West direction. And then in the North, we have the hummingbird, and in the east, the condor. And, well, long story short, there's a prophecy about, um, may, maybe many heard of this prophecy of the condor and the eagle flying together. So nowadays, people speak about condor or eagle in the east. And what happens is that each, um, each quadrant give, is, is filled with with insights and with the way of perceiving the world. So it also, it, it connects us with deep, different aspects of our brain so we could truly perceive the world different. So the serpent, in a way, it helps us um, connect to our reptilian, most ancient brain, and it can help us realize when something is too hot or too cold for us or too rough or too, to help us sense texture. And everything is just as seems to be. So it resets our instinct to go into a place that is safe for our bodies, for our life on earth right now. So it really is a, an amazing garden keeper of the integrity of our life here. Mm -hmm. And then the mm -hmm. jaguar is connected to the limbic brain, so it resets our instinct on, um, on what is um, safe for us and where, is, where there's danger, danger that we must avoid and, and it helps us see through beyond what it seems to be and so forth. And then hummingbird in the north, it really helps us see where the nectar of life feels is so where are the flowers where are the colors we are not here just tracking danger but we are here also to find beauty and to create beauty so this is more like the neocortex of the brain and finally eagle or condor help us connect with that aspect of the brain that um, that transcends um, the the little me and it helped us see that place in which life is just a web of a connectedness and, and we are all breathing the same breath. And, and so it's more like a, a perspective of seeing um, with great vision that even that the earth is, is part of a, of a solar system and a galaxy. So it gives us great perspective and it helps us transcend anything that might look like an obstacle and just remind us that it's just uh, an opportunity to fly higher. So along those lines in the medicine wheel, and then a whole another, um, I can tell you more about what happens in each quadrant when we go through it. Sure. I, I find it very interesting to place also the shamanic path in uh, in that uh, going through the circle of those four in activating these qualities that you're mentioning. And when we talked before too, you and I, uh, 
you were talking, referring to the different types of shamans in their different stages of development, which I also find very interesting under the light of the medicine wheel. I wonder if you could yeah. speak about that as well. Just a little Great. bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so along the same lines with serpent, um, because who is a shaman? So first of all, the word shaman, we must remember it comes from um, the Tungusic language in the region of Siber Siberia. And it, it came to the West um, because of the work of some anthropologists that took it to Russia and then from there to the eastern side of Europe and then traveled the world since the um, 1700s. So, and, and then the word it started to be used um, to just kind of like speak about the, the medicine people of the different traditions, but we must remember that you go to any um, native society, traditional society, and they don't, some of them don't even know the word uh, shaman. So if you go and you say, okay, who is the shaman of this, of this community? Like, wh who is a sh what is the shaman? We don't know. <laughs> is that it? So, um, so we kind of like put on a basket all these people that could, that had a sensitivity to perceive the spiritual world and bring messages from the spirit world that could help the community. And some of these people do go into trance to, to do that. Some with the help of, of, um, of, of plants or, or just by drumming or dancing or, or some of them just um, have an ancestors that just start speaking through them or, or many ancestors. So in different ways, they kind of go into trance are able to bring messages. But the, this person usually is in service to the community. And what, a sh what we call a shaman, so if we put everybody in a basket, what does it look like? It looks different depending of the stage of development of that, um, of that person, of that shaman, um, a medicine person. So um, we, when we teach in our school, I run a shamanic school, and I like to say that when a Westerner come to this shamanic school, don't pretend, don't aspire to become like a traditional shaman, but aspire to be you with these extra gifts that we can acquire, these extra technologies that can help us perceive more in the invisible. But so um, when you become a shamanic practitioner, you, or even in traditional societies, might be more called or interested in helping the community heal um, the physical body. So like um, healing wound, wounds at the physical level, uh, repairing bones, helping a baby being born. So I might become a master of herbs, and I might be also very good at helping animals that are sick. So we say that the portal is the physical body and what can be touched, everything that is more solid. So we say these are the shamans of the earth element. Then we can speak about the west and jaguar and the shamans of the water element. And, and these shamans are are kind of like, like water, like a river, very fluid in, in traveling through time and, and also um, tracking emotions. So is, is the shaman that really is always looking behind in the, in, the, in the dark, like what other people cannot see or don't dare to, to see what they're afraid to see. So they're always looking at the fear at, at the emotional level, and always trying to find that root cause at, at that emotional level. And, and they're very fluid in, in the way they, 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 they perceive. Um, so it's, it's very much like the shaman of the Amazon forest, of the jungle. And then the shaman of the north, and the fire element 
is the storyteller, the one that is the wisdom keeper. He's her passion, her place in life has, has brought her to, to try to remember the stories that enlighten others, that can also bring healing by awakening people, awakening people's minds, about awakening people's hearts. So it's not only about what is wrong, but like telling the stories that are like um, parables, uh, stories that teach and fables that can awaken people's um, curiosity and mind. So the wisdom keepers, the fire, the light. And then the shaman of the east is the shaman of the ur element. Um, and this uh, medicine person has come to a place in her life um, that her, her call is to see and contemplate reality. And so if we think of the Eastern medicine people from the Eastern traditions, we see a lot of these yogis that are like contemplating, meditating, sitting, but we in, in South America, in the Andes, we speak about that spirituality or shamanism has to be practical. So you have to be able to grow corn with it. And so that's a metaphor, to grow corn uh, with it, to, to feed others, to bring it to the table, to create a feast for others. So the, the shaman that contemplates eventually is also dreaming the world into being. It's contemplating not only what is, but it's contemplating also what is possible for the community or for the world. And not what is most probable, because sometimes what's most probable is more illness, more war, more, um, more, um, disagreements, etc., more hunger, and so forth. So the, the, the shaman, to be a shaman, a medicine person, you have to bring that medicine, that elixir, home. So contemplating what can be done, um, how can the world be different, dreaming it into being. Yeah, Beautiful. so that's an idea. Mm. Beautiful. I was thinking there's a little loudness because of my system, heating system right now. Hope it's not disturbing too much. Um, I am also curious about what, what we, you talk about the Munai key path. Um, you know, it's, it looks like, uh, it looks like that's also part of a movement within the Four Winds Society that complements or carries in some way this description of the different types of shaman. Can you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the Mune Ki has its origins in the transmissions that a mentor uh, would give to a mentee in the Andes. And my husband, Alberto Bioldo, he's a medical anthropologist who went in the 70s and to, I mean, came to South America and spent decades um, being with, first studying like an anthropologist, studying the ways of, uh, of healing of the um, traditional peoples. But then he, uh, fell in love with everything he was discovering and by spending so, so much time with them, he learned and he became a shamanic practitioner. And then he started taking his students um, in, from the US and Europe, people to learn from these um, pacos, is the name of the shamans in the Andes and also in the jungles. Um, and then um, the, the pacos had a way of teaching that it is a transmission in, in, the, in the East, in the Himalayas, they speak about empowerment. So it is like a transmission or empowerment and initiation. 
and they would give their wisdom not just by lecturing, uh, by talking, because they didn't speak Spanish even, or and even less English, but by um, by putting their head, um, their forehead to their forehead, and then transmitting telepathically um, their their wisdom and medicine, and and that's what a, a transmission looks like in the Andes. And of course, it's not like all of a sudden we're gonna give a, a lecture about everything they just told us telepathically, but it's more like they connect us to their lineage, and and it's like they're planting a seed in us, so eventually we can start feeling and sensing more like they do, and and remembering. So this was so instrumental for Alberto and then his school, the Four Winds Society. And of course, it was absolutely instrumental in my development as a medicine person, as a modern medicine person, because I received these transmissions. And the way I describe it to my students is um, it was like the walls of my little life started falling so I could see my neighbor, not with the physical eyes, but with my heart. Um, so I could really feel the pulse of a tree and of the herbs and the, and the grass. And, and they have different levels of initiations. And the, the more that I receive these initiations and all these other people too, the more that my horizons uh, open. So in a way, it helps you grow up and transcend the self-centered uh, me and so selfish and really start feeling in your blood and in your cells, not intellectually, that we are that web of life and that we are in that, in that garden and not just to pull fruit from the trees, but to be stewards and keepers. So the, the moon and key are the, um, the body of these transmissions that Alberto first was able to bring from his decades of living with the, um, sh the medicine people there. And what is really important to acknowledge is that um, he was fortunate to come about these people that somehow hid from the conquest for 500 years until recently. So somehow they did not have this like resentment or fear or hurtful feelings against the, um, the mestizos or the white, the, the uh, outsiders. So he found some mentors that truly saw the um, opportunity for healing and said to Alberto, look, take these car pipes, these transmissions to your people, to your world. You have uh, not our permission only, but our blessing. So um, that has been beautiful. And I think nowadays just to finish up, Susana, uh, with this whole issue of um, cultural misappropriation. Um, it is so important that we honor, as a modern shaman or uh, shamanic practitioner, that we really honor our the origins of the teachings and, and then that, that we share them with that honoring and with their blessing and permission, yes. We were talking also about uh, reciprocity and uh, generosity, how uh, generous some of these uh, traditions are in sharing in the way that you just described, they shared it with Alberto. Um, what, what, how, do, how do you conceive of uh, reciprocity? It's kind of like the, the way that you describe it is as if they were passing it on, right? passing it on without expectation of uh, something back. 
What is your take on that? I my take. Okay, so reciprocity is truly that both parts. Everybody feels like we are all in this win-win place. So it's not reciprocity when I feel like I got wonderful gifts and the other people feel um, feel somehow empty, somehow taken advantage of. So what's really interesting in this case is that um, since we were speaking about dreaming the world into being, and since we are in a sh in a shamanic conversation, so who dreamt whom? Uh, did Alberto found them, found these pe amazing people and got this wisdom to share in the West? Or did they dream Alberto? <laughs> and it's a little bit both ways because um, at one point they had a really important ceremony um, because these initiations had existed for hundreds of years. And, and in the beginning, of course, the origin of these initiations are spirit, um, some luminous beings offering the initiation to that first mentor. And, and and it's like a like a prophet these days, you know. You might be really hit with like uh, an abundant wisdom that helps you see what's coming. And but it it was spirit. It was something beyond that gave you that wisdom. So, the Lord says that these initiations had been given by spirit to people all along. But at some point, the initiations are able to be passed down from mentor to mentee. And then there's a, there's a lineage of, of um, receiving the initiation, and then the next generation receives the initiation, and so forth. So some of these um, initiations existed, but um, there are some initiations that are new. And at one point, uh, Alberto's mentor said it's time for us to to go um, bring this initiation that in Quechua they speak about Karpa initiation that is new and it's going to help us go through these times of great upheaval of great uh, transformation for the world and they were speaking about these times that that is not like one day, one month, one year, but these times of great transformation could be a few decades, like when the Spaniards first or the uh, Europeans first came to the Americas. It didn't happen in, in one year or two years, like a pandemic, one year. It happened through decades, and life was never the same again. So the prophecies speak about these times now that is not just the pandemic one year, but the few years back and few years forward, decades, in which life is never going to be the same again. And they said, we're, we're going to go and we're going to bring this new initiation that is going to help us anchor ourselves in, in, in the place after the, uh, the great transformation. So we know what we need to do during the transformation. So this is very shamanic already, journeying through time, creating a portal, traveling through that portal, through time to start, like a, my husband says, like a hand from the future reaching to get us and pull us through. Um, so we can go through it with more grace and integrity and generosity. And, and and Alberto was there with many Europeans, and, and they say, Alberto, he said, wow, what an honor. This was maybe 1989 or 1990. He said, what an honor that we are here with you doing this. And he said, well, we needed someone to represent the, the, the white ones, the, the foreigners, so thank you for being here. So, you know, in a way, what they were saying is like, uh, they needed Alberto and the group as much as Alberto and the group needed them, in a way. And 
that's kind of like the reciprocity. And, and there's so much to speak about this, Susanna, like how we feel perhaps shy and timid to approach the medicine people in their traditional societies and even afraid that we might be rejected. But I think if we show up with, with a sincere heart and with, with pure intentions, and I feel like some of the traditional peoples also are craving um, um, like a link to, to integrate to the Western civilization somehow um, in a more friendly manner and not be in reservations and be separated because who wants to live like that? And we know too that shamanism has survived for so many thousands of years as a practice, right? Because of this influence of others, you know, and uh, migrations and taking from one one tribe and then with uh, by by outsiders, etc., and has morphed, but keeping its integrity at the core in that way. Mm -hmm. I uh, when you talk about. Uh, when you're talking about the dreaming the other who would hold the tradition and continue it in, you know, maybe the four directions, right? When you're talking about the four winds, I'm thinking also of the four directions. Um, there is also a big responsibility. So it's not just taken, but maybe part of the reciprocity that you're talking about has to do with taking on that in a very serious way very deep way, the continuation of that lineage. Yes, yes. Um, yes, because also what we see that these, um, in these settings um, that are very uh, localized, um, the, like for example, and I keep speaking about these Andean people because they are the ones that I learn most from and are most influenced by, and like they, their children want to um, integrate. They don't want to keep living up at 15,000 feet, cold, sick many times, and, 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 and they want, they're curious, and they want to, they all have cell phones these days. Um, I was, sh I was told by one of my closest um, shamans there, a me beautiful medicine man, how um, they used to be hit by lightning often. And that was one of the ways in which they were called to, to start their shamanic path, being hit by lightning, if they survived. But mm -hmm. he says now that um, they're walking with cell phones, with shoes, with um, shoes with nails, they most often die when they get hit by lightning. Um, so they are, they they see they see it they, very unsustainable to keep living so far away and not not integrating. And, and receiving the benefits of Western civilization. So as much as they want to share the, their medicine uh, in this case, they also want to receive the, the medicine of the Westerner. And I can say in this, in this line that I have been asked, it's so interesting, I have been asked by them, some of them, to, for me to give them my carpi, my transmission, because they want my download of how to be in the Western world, or how to be in this modern world or postmodern world. So I have given, and, and Alberto's mentor also said, Alberto, give me your carpi. I want your download. So we need each other these days. And I feel like many, many of these spiritual traditions that are not religions but spiritual traditions realize that we need to come together to make it through this this crisis that we are experiencing 
That's beautiful. Yeah. That brings me to how the medicine wheel itself also with the different colors symbolize the unity of the different races, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the black and the red and the yellow and the white that way and how it works together. It's, it's not in, a, in total unity if it's not the four of them. That's right. And mm -hmm. it used to be the prophecy of the eagle and the condor coming, flying together. And that is already, it, everybody recognized that that is already um, fulfilled. But I heard from a shaman in, uh, a shaman from Tibet, actually, he said, there's, a, a, it's so interesting, he said, there's a prophecy not, not many know about, not really, um, that we know in our tradition that there's a stone that got cut in half and one is in the west and one is in the east and one day this stone is going to come together again I, so yes the four directions the four quadrants coming together <laughs> yes mm -hmm. so there is uh, in, in Tibet I know that we also have the Andes as a possibility where that uh, half of the stone is is that so Marcella Interestingly enough, we work with stones. The, the altar of the, of the Andean shaman is an altar of stones. Um, so for me, it's fascinating because not just the women, but the men too, they are really masters at weaving their cosmology. And they weave and, and with, of course, they have all these animals living in the mountains, um, llamas or llamas, alpacas and vicuñas, and they collect the wool and then they paint their wool with um, onions and tomatoes and other things. And then they weave their cosmology and they use these sacred cloths um, to put their medicine. So, uh, since they, they walk all day long up and down the mountains, they sometimes have a, an insight or realization, an epiphany, and they find a stone and they anchor that epiphany there. And that stone now has that medicine, so they put it in their weaving. Or they're learning with their mentor, and the mentor might give them a stone and say, okay, now remember this forever, and gives them. So they collect stones collect stones or they find a stone that has a lot of power because it was hit by a lightning. And, and they're amazing, actually, amazing looking stones. Or, or like, um, like uh, um, one with a lot of crystals, so mm. the energy is different. And even um, meteorites, they find a lot of meteorites. So they're fascinating how these altars are, are built with stones. And that's their most sacred and precious thing. So they sit in the ground and their altars are in the ground with them and so humble, humus, earthy. Um, and then you go to Tibet uh, or um, the East and the altars are like on a pedestal and there are these statues and everything is golden. And you have to kind of like look up and everything is, is so, it's so different. So I really, I really, well, of course, the roots in Tibet from as far as I know by standing with this shaman there uh, of course they were sitting on the ground and drumming and also just wearing the dirt all over them and very humble humus earthy also mm -hmm. but nowadays um, many of them have their shrines way up and everything golden but in the end they're still so humble made a, the altar is stones so cool I love it <laughs> Thank you so much. Now it's getting the time for some of our audience uh, members to bring about their questions. And I have several here I would like to read to you. This one is a question from Tia. I love that you mentioned about the word quest coming from question, in quotes. What is your advice for someone beginning this quest? What techniques can you implement to go deep 
within ourselves and discover who we truly are or who we were before we were told who we should be. Mm, beautiful. Thank you for that question. So um, I feel like the most important thing is to ask the question and then to just um, be a little bit fierce and trust your instinct. So your instinct, because we're so afraid to make mistakes, we have been taught to, uh, we gotta follow a certain um, path, go to university, study, get a job, get married, and so much of that American dream that is completely obsolete and many people realize it already. But uh, so we, it's, it's part of our healing as, um, as people in this society is to start trusting our instinct. Um, that is flaw because we are afraid of our instinct because we end up in the wrong place with the wrong people at the wrong time. But at another level, every time that we kind of find ourselves in sort of a mess, of course, is there are no mistakes. It's, it's just a, it's just another lesson. So it's like life is our best school. And if by following our instinct, uh, we make a left turn and we end up at the wrong place at the wrong time, it's like, oops, I guess I had to revisit that classroom. And all right, now I know, now I learn. So really uh, walking with uh, eyes wide open and paying a lot of attention not to keep making the same mistakes. On another note, um, just so if you or anyone is curious about the shamanic path, that's why we work with these allies. And shamans work with allies because we sometimes need that extra help and this serpent jaw or hummingbird eagle reset our instinct. So we don't go left, Jawar said, no, 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 danger there, go to the right instead. And it's a gut feeling because the Jawar is like really turns on our gut instinct. And uh, eventually we want to, we also differentiate about instinct and intuition. So eventually we want to come to that one voice that is our clean intuition rather than 20 different voices. Mom saying one thing, the voice of fear, the voice of the husband, the voice of society, the voice of our ancestors. So finally we also must come to find our own authentic voice. And yeah, and just, I guess, um, not be so afraid of making mistakes, quote unquote. <laughs> there is this other question here, Marcela. That's the question from uh, Mai. What is your advice for overcoming a need for control and fears. I think in my case, they might be linked. I'm afraid of heights and death, and these fears are very debilitating. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Um, so we, again, in this culture, have so many tools and, and um, I guess, again, quest, question, yes, quest. Uh, go on that quest and really, um, like, just say, it, the, I, it, it could be so complex. The why are we afraid? Is it because we inherited from, a, from an ancestor? Is it because in a past life we, we experienced um, um, a traumatic event? So did we inherit it from a past life, from someone in the family, ancestor? Um, but Susana, could you repeat the first part of the question? I think there's a key there. What is your advice for overcoming a need for control and fears? Mm. <laughs> yeah. And along the same lines, daring to make mistakes because at the end there are no mistakes. So I'll just maybe for comfort, you know, my instinct 
took me all the way to the U.S. and then I got myself into such a mess. Um, but that's exactly what I had to live through to learn who I was. So I, I have a little bit the opposite uh, issue because um, I've been told um, that my personality is a little bit like uh, um, if I'm afraid, I will go exactly what, what, where I am afraid, I will go exactly there because I am so afraid of being afraid. <laughs> so just to make sure I'm not afraid, I just go and face my fears right away. And um, so no, no, no easy answer, I think, but find your own, find your way because I feel like the medicine wheel and the shamanic path is so helpful. And again, that's what I can offer most um, advice on. And the medicine wheel, it, it takes us through a really deep process of transformation. So I haven't talked about this. And briefly, in the south direction, we, we tell our story. Um, not to anybody in particular, but we recognize that it's just a story, it's the narrative in our head. Mm -hmm. And we actually, in ceremony, in, in a ritual, we burn it and we say, wow, I'm not that story ever again anymore. I am who I woke up today, period. And so this is all done in ceremony because ceremony uh, operates through a part of our brain that can really create um, transformation more than being in just listening to words and, and doing it from a more linear way. And then in the West, it's, we go through a symbolic death. So we die to whom we have been so we can, we can show up in life like, like with whom we want to be instead of being hunted by our past again. And we work with the ancestors and, and past life and many things like that. But really, the biggest part is like, let's die to whom we have been. And this is very shamanic, to surrender to death so we can be claimed by life. In the north, OK, but it's not only about pulling weeds in the garden. Let's also sow seeds and plant flowers. So what's my passion? What is my creativity? Let's recover our soul, our passion. So it's the soul retrieval. Uh, part of um, of the healing transformational process. And then in the East, um, how I transcend the me so I can be us, we, so um, in a nutshell, yeah. Thank you so much, Marcela, for that answer. Mm -hmm. There is another question here from Muko or Mako. How can we develop the different types of shamanic practices? For example, in the case of storytelling, how can one follow the omen that lead to the source? How can we find the appropriate teaching and honor it? Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. So, I am passionate about stories as well, and I'm always paying attention to teaching stories. And I write them down, and then I share them. So again, finding our own very unique way, and maybe, yeah, pay attention to what resonates for you and why, and reflect on it. And then you can share it with not just telling a story um, like you're telling the news, but you can add that flavor that is personal. Why we must listen to this story? Why it's important for us to listen? So, but it's a very beautiful path. And yeah, yeah, please. Please um, um, go for it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marcela. I think we have still like five more minutes before we leave. And um, 
you know, you have carried us through so many different, uh, you have opened up so many uh, doors today in the way that you've um, expressed yourself and shared and um, and it comes from that place of uh, deep experience in you in that way. I think that one of the questions I still hold for you is, you know, uh, and you have addressed this before, but um, we, uh, when we talk about shaman and you defined the word and stuff, you know, you par particularly refer to one that's the healer in the community. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like one role, you know, that the shaman performs, you know, there are others as well, the priest, etc. you know, the psychopomp, we talk about that also beforehand. Um, so when you see, a, a, you know, particularly a Westerner or Mestizo going through this shamanic path that you're inviting us to, that you're inviting us to, what comes as as the guiding what is the what is the function the guiding role is it i know that this is i, I know you are understanding what i'm trying to say i i i i'll try susanna see if um if i can answer this question i feel like our and here you know, my curiosity took me to read and study a bit of um, a bit of um, depth psychology and Jung, and I feel like it, um, it 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 has that same um, yearning for individuation. Um, so, in a way, if I had to translate it to shamanic uh, language, um, remembering that I am a being like a tree, that it has, it, as a being in this life, I have roots, really deep roots on this earth and on the elements. I am not here without water, without earth, without air, without fire, without light. I am not here. And at the same time, in this, along the same lines, um, that tree has these uh, branches, and I, I, am, I am connected and I'm influenced by the planets and the moons and the cosmos and, and I am vast like the universe. And, and I love that phrase, I am so vast, I contradict myself and we have to give ourselves permission for that. So, and, and, and Jung also, my understanding is that he spoke a lot about this tension of knowing how to walk as someone with uh, these very s selfish survival impulses, like I have to save food for me and my kids and my dog first and foremost. So I have these very survival impulses, instincts. And at the same time, we have such a capacity to transcend um, that and, and, and look at for the well being of everyone. So I feel that ultimately, as a human being, we all want to feel more f complete, whole, and connected because that is health. So more than just healing a specific uh, emo emotional or physical wounding, um, we know also that coming to wholeness, it can, just like the the Eastern tradition speak about the moment you get enlightened, there's no more what, what, um, what wounding. <laughs> so what wounding? Because we realize that there is no wounding. Uh, it's just we forgot. Mm -hmm. And so it's about remembering. And in between, we can have all these technologies to help people and that are so helpful for when we forget. So shamanic technologies are amazing and, and, and Western psychology is amazing also with you know, tools and technologies to help. But at the end, I, we're all humans, shamans, Buddhists, Catholics, I mean, whatever tradition, religion, we are human beings and we share so much. 
Muchas gracias, Marcela, mm. for being, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing yourself, sharing your wisdom, sharing your experience. I will thank pass you, it now. Susana. Sí, <laughs> qué bien. Thank you so much, everyone. Wonderful to be with everyone. Just, um, I hope it helps. Yes, blessings, everyone. Thank you. I will pass it now to Alex. Thank you all so much for attending today. We hope you will join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded. So if you would like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this same link and on our Facebook page. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. Mm -hmm.